Okay, so the third section of the week one lecture is going to be a brief history of psychology. Although psychology has been around for a while, the perception of the field as a scientific discipline that relies on a systematic approach to research is a much newer way of thinking. So let's delve into some of the history of our field and think about where it started, um, where it is now, and how we got there. For a while, psychology was really not differentiated from philosophy, and psychologists didn't run experiments or studies like we do today. Instead, some psychologists spent a lot of time thinking and contemplating the human mind from a philosophical or armchair approach, using that common sense approach that we discussed earlier. Other psychologists thought of psychology as highly connected to spiritualism, which heightened the popularity of seances and mediums who suggested that we can connect with the dead. Still today, some people believe in mediums and ESP. Um, the vast majority of psychologists have firmly placed those practices within the realm of pseudoscience. Potentially the largest movement towards treating psychology as a unique and scientific discipline began in the late 1800s with the work of Wilhelm Wundt. He's often thought of as the father of psychology and was among the first to separate psychology from philosophy. Wundt wanted to think about the mind using objective measurement and controlled studies rather than just common sense. He studied the mind using introspection, which was an experimental self-observation technique where people describe their mental states in response to certain stimuli, like a ticking clock. Um, and he trained a number of graduate students, in fact, just under 200, which helped to disseminate his research and approach and also resulted in the creation of many other labs that used his introspective approach. So graduate students often then take the methodology of their trainer and go on to establish their own lab. Wundt began with the study of the mind, but another question that emerged as a major topic was the study of behavior. Which theory best explains behavior? There were many different perspectives to understanding and shaping human behavior, um, so let's go through some of those. Um, here are some of the great theoretical frameworks that have played a role in developing the field of psychology as we know it now. So the great question that sort of shaped this was what unifying perspective best explains behavior. So next, I want to take a quick crash course through these five theoretical frameworks of structuralism, functionalism, behaviorism, cognitiveism, and psychoanalysis. So first up is structuralism. The major figures behind this movement were E.B. Titchener and our old friend Wundt, who are both pictured here. Titchener was actually Wundt's student, and it's often suggested that Wundt deserves way more credit for the theory than he's actually given. Um, but Wundt's work built the foundation, and then Titchener expanded on it to develop the structuralist movement. The structuralist framework wanted to analyze the adult mind using a reductionist approach. So they wanted to break down the mind and consci consciousness into a map. So if we were to say that the mind is like a computer with behaviors and answers like outputs, um, structuralists wanted to figure out all of the equations and codes that make up the way we think, feel, and behave. So they wanted to identify the most basic elements of the psychological experience and ask questions like, what's conscious thought like? Structuralism had a few fatal flaws. The first is the subjective nature of personal thoughts and feelings. So even highly trained introspectionists were producing high variability and disagreement in their subjective reports. So the question becomes, how can we generalize those ideas to the larger population? Another problem was that structuralists didn't know how to grapple with thought that occurs outside of the conscious experience. So if I asked you all the answer to two plus two, you would likely be able to come up with the answer of four without having to think about it. That information is so deeply ingrained. If I asked you what you were thinking about when you came up with the answer, you would likely not be able to answer me because it doesn't take conscious effort to recall that two plus two equals four. The same thing with driving a route that you are very familiar with. It just doesn't take conscious thought as opposed to if I asked you to calculate a really challenging math problem or to drive a new or difficult route. This is known as imageless thought or thinking unaccompanied by conscious experience. 
Finally, another problem was thinking that introspection could teach us everything we needed to know about the field of psychology, which it can't. Despite the limitations, the structuralists did offer some really important contributions to the field, namely the idea of systematic observation, or an objective, well-ordered method for close examination of some phenomena or aspect of behavior, so as to obtain reliable data unbiased by observer interpretation. Systematic observation is still critical and widely used in today's research, and it has its roots all the way back in structuralism. Up next is functionalism. The major figure here was William James, who in turn took many of his inspirations from Charles Darwin's work on evolution and natural selection, and the idea that physical and behavioral characteristics evolved as strategies for survival and reproduction. So while structuralists asked questions concerned with the what, so what does conscious thought look like? Functionalists asked why questions, such as why do we sometimes forget things? Functionalists believed that Darwin's theory of natural selection could also be applied to human behavior, and the ways that we act and behave serve deeper, more adaptive purposes. They believed that it was the job of psychologists to suss out the evolved functions that psychological characteristics serve. So in other words, all behavior has a purpose, and understanding the roots of the purpose can help us understand the behavior. Now, functionalism moved away from the focus on the structure of the mind and towards a focus on how conscious thought is related to behavior. It asked, how does the mind affect what people do? It also emphasized that there's a great deal of individual differences that we must account for when studying human behavior. William James did not believe in introspection. He argued that, quote, Careful introspection doesn't yield a fixed number of static elements of consciousness, but instead an ever-changing stream of consciousness. Functionalism served as a really important influence on psychology through promoting the rise of behaviorism, applied psychology, and many of the theories and beliefs that shaped today's educational system, such as Dewey's belief that you should be teaching children at the level they're developmentally prepared for. Functionalism is also present in today's studies of how evolutionarily functions influence personality traits and emotions. So again, when we look at the field today, we can still see our roots that date back to the functionalist movement. Now, after a while, people started to get sick of structuralism and functionalism. The biggest beef was that consciousness and introspection were not falsifiable. No one could ever disprove them. People started to get really frustrated with this viewpoint and began to clamor for something that was more objective. So enter John B. Watson, who had an answer to these issues. His response was that we need to focus on objective, observable behaviors that occur outside the organism. Watson was the founder of what is today the field of behaviorism, although he's not the only famous behaviorist. You've probably all heard of Ivan Pavlov's work on classical conditioning with the salivating dogs, right? Anyway, Watson believed that thoughts and feelings were irrelevant to behavior. You could take those thoughts and feelings and put them in a little black box, which could be tucked away inside the closet. So this is known as the black box theory. Now, a lot of people really struggle with behaviorism's approach to thoughts and feelings. They were kind of taken aback, going, what do you mean it doesn't matter how I'm feeling? We're talking about treating mental health. How can that not be important? So this raises the question of, is it possible to change behavior without considering thoughts and feelings? Now, Watson would say, absolutely, of course it is. I can change your behavior. I don't need anything else. Let's take depression, for example. Think about some characteristics or behaviors that are associated with depression. So maybe crying, spending time in bed, avoiding social events, loss of appetite. Now those are all objective behaviors. I can change all of those behaviors through a series of behavior techniques. So let's say I do that. I create a behavior plan. I am able to shape your behavior so that you're no longer spending time in bed, you're not crying, you're out and about, eating at a normal rate, maintaining weight, I've now effectively eliminated the symptoms that characterize depression, right? So are you still depressed? It's a bit of a philosophical question there, one that can be argued on either side. Now, after Watson, Skinner came along with a slightly different take. Watson thought that thoughts and feelings were completely irrelevant, might as well not even be there. Skinner was a little less firm. He said, well, 
I don't think we need to worry about thoughts and feelings in terms of shaping behavior, but they're there. I mean, we can't say that they don't exist and that they're not important at all. Behaviorism's major contribution to the field was the shift towards objective, observable science. Unlike structuralism and functionalism, which preceded it, behaviorists really rely on objective data and consistently make data-driven decisions. You'll still see the roots of behaviorism today, particularly in the field of applied behavior analysis, which is a sub-branch. We'll talk a little bit more about that um, when we get to the chapter on behavior and learning, but largely in mainstream psychology, we've moved back towards incorporating thoughts and feelings into the mix. And the most prevalent and lasting influence of behaviorism on the field is that focus on objective data. While behaviorism was often referred to as black box psychology, um, so remember the mind is a black box where thoughts and feelings live, they're irrelevant to behavior. Cognitivism sort of tried to open up that black box. Similar to what happened with the rise of behaviorism, people began to get fed up with the way behaviorists neglected cognition. From this frustration rose cognitivism, which argued that our thinking impacts our behavior in relevant and powerful ways. They were concerned with how we gain knowledge and examine learning, memory, problem solving, and intelligence. Cognitivists tackled questions such as, how does problem solving change through childhood and adulthood? In fact, Jean Piaget was a cognitivist who made compelling and lasting arguments for the study of developmental psychology. We still very much use his teachings today. When I teach lifespan development, we spend quite a bit of time talking about him and his work. Um, all rooted back into that field of cognitivism. So cognitivism is still very much alive today in psychology, and it's also branched out to influence a number of different fields. So as I mentioned, one is developmental psychology, but it's, often, it's also reached into the world of neuroscience. In fact, a whole new field has recently been developed called cognitive neuroscience, which examines how our thoughts influence the very way that our brains function. Ah, psychoanalysis, arguably the most famous of all the psychological movements. I'm sure you've all heard of Sigmund Freud and his teachings, from Freudian slips to the Oedipus complex to dream analysis. Freud was one of the major figures of psycho psychoanalysis, along with Carl Jung. Now, chronologically, psychoanalysis actually ran parallel to behaviorism, but it was in Europe while behaviorism was uh, occurring in the United States. The main ideals of psychoanalysis really couldn't get much further from those of behaviorism. So psychoanalysis was based on the idea that our behaviors are mainly guided by internal unconscious drives, such as sexuality or aggression. Psychoanalysis aimed to decode hidden symbolic meanings in everyday analyses, I'm sorry, everyday actions and activities and dreams and symptoms in order to explain away our psychological conflict. Psychoanalysts placed a large emphasis on child experiences in explaining personality, focusing really heavily on unconscious processes, which are very hard to research and study systematically. As you might have guessed, they are not falsifiable. Many of Freud's theories are pretty highly controversial and are not given much credit today, but their emphasis on the fact that much of our mental processes occurs outside of our own awareness has had a pretty lasting effect on the field today. We'll talk a little bit more about Freud when we get to personality. The code for this week's quiz is fireworks, all lowercase, one word. So that concludes our tour, our brief journey through the history of psychology. Now, please note, this was by no means exhaustive. I wanted to just sort of give you the quick and dirty overview. But now that we've covered the early history of psychology, let's talk about psychology today. Today, it's a thriving field. There are about 500,000 psychologists worldwide, with 100,000 of them or so living in the United States. The American Psychological Association, which is one of the biggest organizations in the field of psychology, was founded in 1892 and is the world's largest association of psychologists with about 150,000 members. There are so many different hats you can wear as a psychologist and so many different fields or disciplines that fall under the broad umbrella of careers in psychology. 
I want to cover just a few of the more prominent ones, as I'm sure many of you are beginning a journey as future psychologists and are curious about what that means and where to go. Now, this is not a careers class, so I'm not going to, too far in, to go too far in depth, but I am more than happy to talk with any of you individually if you have more specific questions. One of the largest areas of psychology is clinical. They work with people with mental, dis mental health disorders. Mainly, there are therapists who have different degrees, usually at the doctoral level. Clinicians also um, often conduct research as well, which is probably the key distinction between clinical psychologists and counseling psychologists. There's a misconception that you need a PhD to become a therapist, which is not true. Many practice at the master's level. Clinical PhD programs are super competitive and have a very heavy research focus. Clinical psychologists primarily work in colleges or universities, mental health centers or clinics, private practices, and they typically deal with severe issues such as schizophrenia or major depressive disorder. Counseling psychologists can also have a doctoral degree or just a master's degree. They commonly deal with life problems such as marital problems, job stress, things like that. They often work in counseling centers, hospitals, and private practices. Another key difference between counseling psychologists and clinical psychologists is that counselors typically deal with less severe mental health issues. There's also school psychologists who conduct assessments and develop intervention programs at the school level. They help test children for IEPs or individual education plans. This is different from educational psychology, which looks more at the developing the methodology for learning and teaching. Developmental psychology is my own field of study. Um, developmental psychologists are interested in why and how people change over time or how we develop throughout the lifespan. Many developmental researchers pick one area to focus on, so childhood, adolescence, adulthood, one of the things that appealed to me about developmental psychology was the ability to account for change across time. We don't stay the same our whole lives. We learn and grow and adapt. And developmental research really lets us factor that into our research and our sort of whole person understanding. Now, developmental psychologists are not clinicians. So someone in that field like me would never see patients or go into private practice. We're strictly researchers and academics or teachers. Experimental psychologists use sophisticated research methods to study memory, language, and thinking. I'm not super familiar with this branch, so I won't say too much more about it than that, but if anyone has any specific questions, I'm happy to delve in further. Biological psychologists hark back to those levels of understanding we talked about earlier. They look on the lower level at how thoughts and behaviors are shaped by brain functioning. They're interested in the physiological bases of behavior. They typically work in research settings. Now again, biological psychologists are typically not seeing clients. They tend to be academics and researchers. Forensic psychology is a bit rarer than the others, but definitely makes its presence known. I'm sure many of you are thinking about crime shows like CSI, but in reality, that's not what forensic psychologists do as a general rule. What they do is work in prisons and jails to assess and diagnose incarcerated individuals and to assess, assist with rehabilitation and treatment. So here's an exception to my previous statement. Often for, uh, forensic psychologists are trained as clinicians or counselors and develop expertise in mental health disorders that are associated with crime or incarceration, things like kleptomania or sexual assault perpetration. They can also be researchers on topics um, like eyewitness testimony and the ways that juries can make decisions. IO psychology or industrial organizational is newer but still a force. They're typically found in companies and businesses working to increase productivity, company morale, evaluate performance, and so on. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about behavior analysis. I snuck this in there because it's really an up-and-coming area of psychology and also because I trained as a behavior analyst before coming to Temple. So ABA, or Applied Behavior Analysis, grew directly out of the behaviorist movement and is a field of psychology used today to shape behavior. You'll most commonly find behavior analysts working in schools and residential facilities for people with developmental disabilities like autism, but there's a growing movement that uses this science to shape all kinds of behavior 
and can help with all kinds of health outcomes like smoking cessation, weight loss, even things like increasing seatbelt wearing. So now that we've talked a bit about the past and current states of psychology, let's take a brief look at what's ahead to come. Two of the largest and most prominent debates through the field are that of nature versus nurture and free will versus determinism. I'm sure you've all heard of nature versus nurture, the question of which has a larger impact on the human behavior. Is it nature or our genes and biological predisposition? Or is it nurture, the way we were raised in our environmental contexts? As I hinted earlier when we talked about the levels of analysis, there's not one answer. Nature and nurture um, tend to interact to produce the effect, and the answer to which one is important is always both. So a better question rather than which one is more important tends to be how can we think about both nature and nurture in understanding the human experience. Second is that of free will versus determinism, or the question of to what extent are our behaviors freely selected or caused by factors outside of our control. Are we free to do whatever we want? Well, sort of, but others will say that free will is an illusion and we are following a predetermined path. Determinists will say that our choices are governed by thousands of influences so subtle that we're not even aware of them. So we think we're free, but we're really just unaware of the influences acting on us. Now, there are many other debates within our field, which we'll talk about a bit in the coming weeks, but those are two of the biggest and most long lasting. Um, and here I just wanted to give you a sneak peek into the scientific method as an ongoing process. We're going to talk more about this in the next class, um, well, next week when we talk about research methods. But this is a good chart to help us think about science as this sort of cyclical ongoing process. So we move from making observations to thinking of questions to formulating hypotheses, and we go around in a circle um, over and over and over. So to show you that the scientific method is not a static sort of set process, but it's fluid. So to wrap up this chapter, I hope you're starting to learn to think scientifically and to see the value of um, scientific thinking, not just in this course, but how it can help you make better decisions in other areas of your life as well. The other take home point is that when confronted with claims from popular psychology and popular culture, remember to insist on evidence. So that's all for week one. Um, please make sure that you do the quiz and the discussion posts by 1159 on Sunday night. And we will talk more next week about research methods.